Good morning on behalf of all of us here at the Cooper Institute. We want to welcome you to the first of the Coffee with Cooper virtual series that focuses on taking control of your health and working towards a healthier future. This series will present up-to-date health and wellness information and offer suggestions for healthier living based on proven science. At the end, we will provide time for questions from the attendees. My name is Laura Defina, and I am the president and CEO of the Cooper Institute. For those who wanna know more about the Cooper Institute, we were established in 1970 by Dr. Cooper as a nonprofit to promote lifelong health and wellness through research, education, and advocacy. By improving public health, the Cooper Institute helps people to lead better, longer lives now and well into the future. It is my pleasure today to welcome Dr. Cooper, known as the father of aerobics. Dr. Cooper has dedicated his 64 year medical career to investigating the links between cardiorespiratory fitness, good health and longevity he has helped millions improve the quality and quantity of their lives. When Dr. Cooper published his bestseller aerobics in 1968, he not only introduced a new word to our vocabulary, aerobics, but also a new concept to the world, exercise as medicine. Dr. Cooper is recognized as the leader of the international physical fitness movement and is credited with increasing the number of people who exercise in pursuit of good health more than any other individual. Dr. Cooper is here today to talk with us about preventive medicine and the many benefits of vitamin D. As I said earlier, we will have a few minutes at the end for Dr. Cooper to answer questions. So please use the Q&A function on your Zoom application, and we will get to as many of those questions as we can at the end. It is now my honor to introduce Dr. Kenneth H. Cooper, the father of aerobics, to talk to us this morning. Dr. Cooper. Thank you, Laura, and welcome to the people who are viewing this this morning. So this presentation is preventive medicine. It's more beneficial and cost-effective to prevent disease than to find a cure. We promoted that concept for over 51 years here at the Cooper Aerobic Center. It all goes back to 1968 when the publication of this little book came out called Aerobics. It became an international bestseller, primarily because it was featured in Reader's Digest with the title Aerobics, the exercise program developed by a US Air Force doctor, how to feel fit at any age. As customary, you would expect there was the critics of this program and saying, oh, this is just another fad. It won't last. But if you look at the Gallup poll, back in 1968, we had less than 100,000 joggers in America at that time. Less than 24% of our adult actress, people, adults were exercising regularly. But it didn't fad out because by 1990, we had 30 million people from 100,000 people in 1960 to 30 million. At the present time, well, it's 2018, 2019, so figures we have about 56 million Americans are still exercising regularly. But back to 1968, I'm happy to say that I ran my first Boston Marathon in 1962. I placed 101st in the Boston Marathon. That sounds fantastic. Only 150 people ran it back in those days. It wasn't much of an accomplishment. But I presented this data and we found out that contrary to expectations, the heart's going to be, the streets are going to be full of dead joggers. They followed the group of concept. Heart disease went down by 48% during that period of time. Around the world, only three other countries had that same statistic, Australia and Canada and New Zealand, along with us, had that 48% decrease. But most of the countries around the world had an increase. For example, in Russia, it increased 31%, in Poland, 36%, in Hungary, 40%, in Romania, 60%. But you know that decrease that occurred in 1968, that was controversial even as late as 2019. It was in USA Today. I quote verbatim, Deaths from coronary heart disease, heart attacks, and other consequences of clogged arteries peaked in 1968. NIH said that. The initial decline was so steep, it was, it was hard for some scientists to believe it. But after much debate, 
they decided it was real. It was real. And so it, it, it did occur, no question about that. And why? It was because of modern technology. No, only one third of that decrease from 1906 to 1990 can be attributed to modern technology. I'm talking about balloon angioplasties, stents and bypass surgery, and even the use of uh, satin drugs wasn't really a problem until the late 1980s. So something else happened. 67% was because of lifestyle, because 76 million people born between 1946 and 1964 led a health revolution we've never seen before, nor we've seen since. It came to an end roughly in 1990. Who were they? Baby boomers, born between 1946 and 1964. What they do? Number one, they quit smoking in great numbers. They dry cigarette smoking from 46% down to 24% during that period of time. They better, better control their blood pressure, went from 15 to 55% during that period of time. Better control of their cholesterol. The Middle East American male dropped his total cholesterol from 234 down to 204 during that period of time. Learn how it affects the stress and how they control it. And they exercise. Look at that reverse. What's the best way to control stresses I've used for 60 years plus? And that's exercising at the end of the day prior to the evening meal so I can control the stress in my life after my 12 hour days here working. I'm 90 years of age and still working up to, up to 15, 60 hours a week. But I work out before I go home at night. I spend an hour here at the fitness center. I go home and then walk the dog. So I get my exercise in at least five to six days a week on a regular basis. What about the best for way to increase the HDL or good cholesterol is aerobic exercise. What's the best way to prevent high blood pressure, even treat high blood pressure, and that is aerobic exercise. And what's the best way to break the cigarette smoking habit permanently? And that's start an exercise program. Because you can't, you can't just stop it. You've got to replace it with something. So replace cigarette smoking, replace alcohol abuse with exercise. Might be surprises, throughout the prize to see what's happening. You know, unfortunately, this hasn't continued. It was published in 2019 that heart disease progress stalls to stagnation. Last four or five years, there's been no decrease. It's been just stagnation. And it's hard. In fact, it's even roaring back, published in 2019. Why is it coming back after this rough, after this fantastic thing since 1968? Why is it now roaring back? For an article published in the Wall Street Journal in 2019, young people and women are more often stricken. And death for cardiovascular disease has only dropped 4% since 2011. Why? Because obesity and diabetes have stalled the decline. We know that. We know life expectancy has been dropping here recently. They say because of opioid and because of addiction and because of COVID, rather. And, and it's not because of that. It's because obesity and diabetes has been the major problem. We've seen these changes going the wrong way. For example, in 1990, we had only 13% of our children avoid obese, and now we have 36%. In 1990, we had 36% of our adults avoid obese, that's now 70%. We're in the midst of an obesity and diabetes epidemic that is shortening our life and is taking and something that can be prevented. One of our most famous studies that we published this institute over the last 51 years came out and published back in 2013. We followed 28,000 people for a period of 25 years. Now keep it, understand this closely because they were 59, they were 49 to 50 years of age, they came to the clinic, 21% were women. They were all healthy. We followed them for 25 years, it's only one variable and that was their level of fitness measured by time on the treadmill. The classifies people from very poor, poor, good, excellent, superior. These people were in the good category of fitness, the top 40% the percentile and compared to the bottom 40% and we found these people, the top 40 percentile, after 25 years, this is published in February 2013, and it was internal medicine, that there was a 36 percent reduction in deaths from, from Alzheimer's disease. In this group, first the bottom category. Now, why would that occur? Only variable we looked at was chronic, was, was their level of fitness. This came out back in May, June 2019 in Harvard Magazine. And it says this at the bottom. It says, could inflammation be the cause of myriad chronic conditions? Because they point out in this article, you can have a brain full of amyloid plaque and tau protein, which causes Alzheimer's. But if you don't have inflammation, you don't get the disease. Chronic inflammation is obviously caused to, causal to the process. You, have trouble, you can actually reverse the pathology. What is chronic inflammation? We have acute inflammation. You cut your finger, have an infectious process but you can have some smoldering chronic inflammation. We measured that by the C-reactive protein. And physicians are not paying attention to the importance of chronic inflammation. We haven't even concentrated on this in the past. I hope what we're doing now with this forthcoming documentary is coming out of my life. I make physicians more aware of the fact you need to concentrate on measuring chronic inflammation and trying to correct it because evidence has been proving that chronic inflammation can be associated with these diseases, 
Alzheimer's, cancer, arthritis, asthma, gout, psoriasis, anemia, multiple sclerosis, diabetes, depression, Parkinson's are all indeed triggered by chronic inflammation, also published in the article from Harvard. All right, now what is the cause of chronic inflammation? Oxidative stress, pollution, cigarette smoking, processed foods, sugar and refined carbohydrates, and inactivity and obesity causing chronic inflammation. Why right, are those people at 36% reduction in Alzheimer's dementia if they're in good category of fitness? Because these people for 25 years were lean and active trend. Those people in category were overweight and obese. And I'm convinced that that was a major reason why we saw this tremendous difference in the problem with Alzheimer's dementia. The top category was about a category, category because of inactivity and obesity. Inactivity is prevalent throughout this country. And it's concentrated, as you can see in this particular slide, in the southeastern part of the United States. We also can see obesity is concentrated in that area too. And so we do have steps to prevent Alzheimer's and dementia. In addition to exercise, think of these things. Engage the brain daily. In my advanced days, in 90 plus years, I try to read every day. I go home and study at night. I study, I studied this morning. I'm going through preparing for another, another series of articles and presentations I'm giving. Engage the brain daily because you need to exercise the brain, you need to exercise the body. Exercise at least 30 minutes, collective or sustained, most days per week. Doesn't take that much to get this benefit. Sleep, very important for preventing Alzheimer's dementia, at least seven hours of sleep per night. Delay retirement. Zig Ziglar once said that you don't retire, you refire. And so that's what I'm trying to do in my advanced years. I'm still working 15, 60 hours a week and love it. Enjoy with my patients and enjoy working with these people. Socialize, join a club, group, volunteer, organization. No tobacco use of any type. Use alcohol in moderation, if at all. And diet, healthy diet, Mediterranean type diet is strongly recommended. I don't follow that, but I follow this concept. I try to get five to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables every day. If you can do that, you get roughly equivalent Mediterranean diet. I start my breakfast every morning with at least one to two fruits. This morning I had blueberries and I had grapefruit this morning on my oatmeal. I had binnacle that keeps my cholesterol down. And take vitamins, very important as far as preventing Alzheimer's dementia. 400 micrograms of B12 day, 2,000 interactions of vitamin D day, and 1,000 milligrams of omega-3. Those are all very important. Hopefully in the question and answer period, I want to talk more about vitamin D and omega-3 because that's something we've been basing for the last 10 years here at the clinic. One of the few clinics in the world that's doing this all of our patients. We have some amazing data showing that vitamin D high levels have a great have a great deal of protection against Alzheimer's and dementia. And also we know omega-3 can be a factor in brain health, can be a factor in, in controlling anxiety, depression. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But those are very important points as far as a good overall preventive medicine program is taking the vitamin supplementation. We've been we've been leading this, this concept and idea for a long time. We've published many articles about such things as vitamin D and cognitive ability and cognitive D and dementia, all these various things. And don't forget, coronary risk factors must be controlled for preventing Alzheimer's dementia. What is good for the heart is also good for the brain. This also was exciting to point out that from this article, from this, uh, this Medicare study, is those people that were followed for 25 years, we got their Medicare date, top category of fitness, good and excellent, superior category of fitness, bottom categories, very poor and poor. These people in that top category of fitness have made 65 to 75, their cost of health care was 40% less than the bottom category. You show me anything in the scientific literature that has proven you can prevent Alzheimer's dementia and you can control the cost of health care. We've got the best state in the world on those two subjects right now. And we need to get this message around the world because we are showing something amazing too. That people coming to our clinic are living longer than the national average. For example, we've been following a total of 100,000 patients who come to this clinic for 20 to 22 years and been following them, and we find out that our men's average life expectancy is, uh, is, is 86.7 years. Our women are 90.4 years. Average American woman is living 79 years. Average American man, 77.5 years. And our people are squaring off the curve, living a long, healthy life with both and dying suddenly. That's the way I want to die. I don't want to die that long, slow death of Alzheimer's. I want to square off the curve, and at 90 years of age, that's what I'm hoping to. Well, how do our people do that? And that is by getting cooperized. I know most of you know about this, but these are eight concepts we recommend for our people to get cooperized. Number one, body weight, body mass index under 25. 25 to 30 is normal. 30 to 35 is obese, about 35 is morbidly obese. We want our people less than 25. You can go to the internet 
and enter your height and your weight, get your BMI determination. You can find out what your body mass index by going to the internet. We'll check that very easy. Number two is, is nutrition. Consume five to 10 a servings of fruits and vegetables every day, as I mentioned earlier. Exercise, I mentioned 30 minutes, but it was most days per week. Supplementation, talked about that. Tobacco, none of any type. Alcohol, no more. If you drink, I don't drink at all. I don't recommend alcohol. But if you do drink, no more than seven drinks a week. Neither men nor women should drink more than seven drinks a week. Study published in Lancet last year, probably followed a large group of people about 30 years, and they found if men would drink two drinks a day or 14 a week, which has been accepted in this country for a long time, and some big women should drink one a day and seven a week, and men two a day or 14 a week. If the men drink 14 drinks a week, they shorten their lifespan by one and a half to two years, just by alcohol. And then alcohol, no drugs, stress control, controlled by exercise, by meditation, relaxation techniques, and the examinations we're doing here. People have critiqued us even recently, New England Journal of Medicine was talking about in general, these executive examinations we do here are really not that valuable. But I would say the examinations done by most physicians, annually exams are not that valuable. It's just a very cursory type of evaluation. But you come here for an all day examination and we're gonna find things we, we find every day that people are have pending something very important. I I do had a man this past week, he came in, thought he was healthy at 61 years of age, but he had a high coronary calcification score. Put him on the treadmill, it was abnormal. Did a CT angiogram. We do those here. You don't have to go in the hospital and have a catheter put up in your groin and look at the coronary arteries. We do it by injecting contrast media into the arm. We found he had severe through vessel disease. When he got him over the hospital, he had four cents the next day. He thought he was perfectly healthy. Didn't have any symptoms, 61 years of age, because the most common first symptom of severe heart disease is sudden death. 40% of the people, the most common, the most, most prevalent symptom is sudden death. That's the only symptom they have of heart disease. So don't die of something stupid. Our goal here is a twofold. Number one is to try to prevent cancer and heart disease. If we can't prevent it, diagnose it early. And we're doing that daily. Over, over 2,400 cases of prostate cancer, over 600 cases of breast cancer, of lung cancer, rather. And our people are living longer than the national average because we're picking it up early. Those examinations are very, very important. Old people talk about the expense of your exam. Well, it's expensive. Yes, it is expensive. All things we do, nobody else in the country does it. We're ranked number two in America behind the Cleveland Clinic. It's having the most comprehensive corporate examination in America. Behind us, you have Duke, you have Johns Hopkins, and you have the Mayo Clinic. We're ranked number two. We've had that ranking for a long time. And so corporate America is coming to us. 50% of our patients are corporate sponsored. And 74% of our patients are return patients. They're coming back. So that's why my database over a million persons will follow up on patients and over 300,000 actual performance treadmill stress tests. No one has that data anywhere in the world. That's why we're becoming world renowned with our work. Just recently, I passed my 90th birthday, March the 4th. Received over 1,200 compliments from throughout the world. Congratulations on my birthday from at least 20 countries. It's gone all over the world. Even the Research Institute encouraged people to make a contribution. And on my, on my birthday, I passed $125,000 already. People sending money in. People recognize what this institute is doing. Recognize the Cooper Institute all over the world now. And we have pioneered preventive medicine in a professional form as it should be. But the examination is very important. Yes, it's expensive, but I like to ask my patients, would you pay for the insurance on your car last year? Would you pay for the insurance on your house last year? You can buy a new car, you can build a new house, you've got one body. Our body is so, so, unique, so uniquely designed that they, can, that they can disguise problems. We have to exercise a person on the treadmill to at least 85% predicted maximum heart rate because the heart can, dis can disguise those problems of disease until you break that barrier. And that's why we've proven that heart testing on the treadmill can be very successful. And I pioneered treadmill stress testing when I was working for NASA in the Air Force because we didn't have a means of monitoring EKGs on active exercising subjects. We didn't have the technology to develop that. So working with former astronaut Bill Thornton, we worked together back in 1964 to get technology. We could read an EKG on exercising subjects. They wanted to have monitoring of the astronauts in, in space, monitor their EKG. We did that back in 1964. But fast forward now, that's been the major thing we discovered as the first test in diagnosing coronary disease is a treadmill stress set. It can't be done. I had to go before the Board of Censors back some 51 years ago here in Dallas because I was doing something as dangerous as treadmill stress tests. I'd done 10,000 tests in the military before I ever came to Dallas. I wasn't censored. My wrist wasn't slapped. And the second person in town had a treadmill for stress testing was the chairman of the Board of Censors. And now it's ubiquitous all over the world. What we pioneered in 1964 has become the first step of diagnosing early heart disease before you have any symptoms. And we've led the way in that with over 300,000 stress tests, as I'm concerned. 
Oh, Dr. Cooper, your prediction of longevity state national average by at least 10 years. Nobody else has done that. Oh, yes, they have. This is published back in 2018 from Harvard School of Public Health. Look what they discovered. Their risk factors, the, their, their risk factors, never smoking, healthy weight, regular physical activity, healthy diet, moderate alcohol. With 78,000 nurses and 45,000 physicians fought for 34 years. Remember, our men are living 87.5, 86.5 years. Their men, 87.6 years. Our women, 90.5 years. Their women, 93.1 years. We've got two data, only one in the world. We've been able to show that by implementing a good preventive medicine program, we're doing it here, like getting cuprage, we can prolong lives and screw up the curve, which is so very important. And they're saying this too, the most unappreciated risk factor in the world is your lifestyle. Because 76% of the diseases we have are preventable and more than 45% of cancers are preventable. MD Anderson says, if you eliminate obesity, inactivity, cigarette smoke, alcohol, you can drop cancer deaths by 60%. And no drug can replicate the benefits of an active lifestyle. And the way to resolve problem is, that is to empower the people, not empowering the government. I have a few minutes, I'm gonna go ahead and talk about vitamin D now, and its medical benefits, because it is a wonder drug. And we've been pioneering this work. We've been measuring vitamin D in our patients here for the last 10 years. We found the original average was only 30. It should be 40 to 60. But our physicians started recommending 2,000 international units per day, along with our Cooper Complete Basic One vitamin. And we've steadily grown up until the last year we averaged 42. We've gone from 30 to 42 as far as the vitamin D is concerned. Our work has shown that the vitamin D clearly relates to COVID-19 because then people of color, I said, because they can't have a high dose of, they can't have a high level of blood unless, unless they take a supplement of vitamin D because you can't manufacture. But what do vitamin D benefits? It reduces inflammation, reduces autoimmunity, reduces cancer cell growth, improves brain function, improves mood and sleep, improves immune function, and reduces the risk of heart disease. That's its benefits. We also plays a very important role in brain function. We know that without question. And listen to this, the vitamin D deficiencies, muscle weakness, rickets, insomnia, cognitive impairment, nearsightedness, improper bone formation, weakening and thinning of bones, increased likelihood of becoming addicted to opioid drugs. You hear what I said? This just came out June the 11th, published from, uh, from Boston, from Massachusetts General. They point out that physicians put patients on opioids after having surgery to control the pain, morphine, lot of something of that type. But they also, physicians have been guilty of getting people addicted to that opioid in the future because they started getting it for pain relief, but then they got addicted. But this clear article clearly shows that if you have a vitamin D deficiency, you're much more likely to get addicted to that morphine that's being used to control pain, whether it's after surgery, control pain of any type. So people are taking pain medication must get that vitamin D level up, even to the extent I think in the future, if you've got elective surgery, they require you to get your vitamin D level measured first. If you don't have a certain level, at least above 40, they'll not get you up to not have elective surgery and you get your vitamin D level up because it may reduce the problem with addiction that it can't be caused from by physician prescription. Very important. The way to increase vitamin D as a skin agent. Our bodies can hand, handle only a certain amount of sun exposure a day. As the skin agent's capacity to produce vitamin D decreases, so supplementation becomes very important as you get older. What actually was uh, created my interest in this vitamin D and, and omega-3, and COVID rather, was the article published in February 2017. And we found that that uh, this said is that vitamin D supplementation prevent re acute respiratory tract infection. But what if people are dying of from COVID-19? They're dying from respiratory tract infections, that's pneumonia. And this article clearly showed a relationship between vitamin D supplementation to prevent respiratory infections. If that's true, would this be important to prevent uh, COVID infections? And so we do have that clear relationship now that, that we have a, a five to seven fold increase in, in the COVID-19 infections in people of color and a twofold increase in hospitalizations in people of color. And we find that very commonly people of color have vitamin D levels in the single digits, 9, 10, 11, 12. Why do we have a problem with this COVID and problem? That is it because the virus itself or because of something else? The answer is clear. It's not because the way the virus causes a problem, it's the way, to respond, the way the body responds to it. Our immune system has a response called the cytokine response. And it's a cytokine response that recurs from the virus that activates the, the damages the lung that causes pneumonia. So we need to be able to suppress that, suppress that cytokine response. And without question, vitamin D does it. They've had several 
clinical trials to find, to find a drug that can suppress that, that cytokine response, and they just can't find one. And why do children, I found the other day that people get the study from England, and they found that these young children, that the instance of death is, like the survival is 99.9% if they come down with COVID. And why do they have some protection, whereas we don't have as adults? Because they have not developed an immune system, they get that overwhelming response called the cytokine response. They only get a very mild response to that. So that's clearly the reason there. And vitamin D has to be a factor in this. And it, the role is infection. The vitamin D levels are severely low in several countries around the world, and correlates perfectly with vitamin D. An article that was published in, in the Journal of Dermatology said this relevance of vitamin D supplements to people of color is just too impressive to be ignored. I submitted an article to the Dallas Morning News back in August 2020, and vitamin D and COVID-19 is their relationship. At that time, they didn't accept the article, but it was picked up and went to 34 countries and 5,312 views, went around the world, started here. Later on in October last year, they published an article in the Dallas Morning News. We're leading the country in this area of vitamin D and COVID-19 infections, and you can do this. And why is obesity tied? The number one cause of hospitalizations for people with COVID-19 is age. And number two is obesity. Why wouldn't it be? be related to vitamin D because vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin. And so people take vitamin D, they think it's stored in the fat tissue that's slowly released. They don't get the same benefit if they're obese as compared to lean as far as taking vitamin D supplementation. So that is something that has to be concerned. We have to be considered about and also eventually some people with tobacco use disorders are eight times more likely to come down with COVID-19, even after adjusting for risk factors such as age and gender. And substance use disorder also shows the same thing. All this is information that you can't ignore. This article published vitamin D, preliminary evidence that COVID infections severely increase in vitamin D deficiencies. And it says this is published in Frontiers of Public Health. Listen to this. The link between vitamin D deficient COVID-19 risk is already too strong to be ignored. It supports action. They say this, correcting possible vitamin D deficiency in COVID-19 pandemic is, extreme, is extremely safe, vitamin D. The article I published then in September 2020, Dallas Morning News was vitamin D deficiency may increase, may, may help avoid COVID-19 infections. But along with this, this article was published in JMA back in uh, 2020, and it pointed out that if you have a vitamin D level of less than 20, that's deficient, there's a 77% increased risk of coming down with COVID-19. Why aren't we paying attention to that? We've had success here in our clinic patients, study of 45,000 patients followed since 2013. When they first hit, came to the clinic, their average was 32.8. It should be 40 to 60. Our physicians started recommending the basic one, 2,000 units a day, look what happened. 32, 34, 38, 36, and by, by 2020, it was 42. And that's the first threshold of which we can show benefits. In testing almost 3,000 people, they're testing them for both the antibody and the antigens. We found in testing these people that our people have one half the national average of what we're finding as far as the antibodies and the antigens. And, and I've even the people that came down to have, a, I did a study, we had 36 people that had, were diagnosed with COVID in this 3,000 study. And I followed up on these people. And none of these people are hospitalized and there's no deaths. I can't guarantee you with a good level of vitamin D that's going to prevent it by the COVID-19, but it's going, to, it's going to attenuate the response, less likely to be hospitalized and death. So we have so much data on that. So we have to be involved in vitamin D. But the other thing I'm very interested in now is omega-3. Because omega-3, I'm writing a series of articles for a decision magazine. And this is the Billy Graham organization. And I've been doing this since January. And this first one was published, God has had his hand on my life. If you ask me, people ask me all the time, going from ground zero to office and two employees back in 1970 here at Preston Center. Now we have almost 500 employees. We're internationally known. Well, I've been successful. I've said without question, number one, divine intervention. Because over the past 51 years, I need to make decisions. I want to go one way, but I went the other way. If I'd gone the way I would have been, I wouldn't be here today. So God has had on my life. But also in this article, I had this sidebar that says that Cooper vitamin D might save your life. This went to 8.5 million people around the world. And it's been overwhelming the response we're getting. And this is the latest article. This came out yesterday in Decision Magazine. It's entitled, Nine Ways to Protect Yourself Against Infectious Diseases. 
This is one of five articles that I've now published. I'm published an article every month here for a while, starting in January. It's going around the world. Our message is going around the world. I will finish with this by saying that, that years ago, as Laura mentioned, I left the Air Force and published aerobics. I had data on people that average age of 26 years. I had Air Force population. I had to have more data to document what I was saying in my books and saying in my articles back in those days. So I established the Cooper Institute six months before I saw my first patient. I had good scientific evidence to validate what I'm doing. By the grace of God, we've kept that alive during this period of time. Our today but now is overwhelming. We've got the whole world coming to us. And I said, we have to, we have to understand that we can't, in the success of this organization has been because of the success of the Cooper Institute. We can't fail if people are watching this presentation today. We've got to keep this thing. I'm an old man. How much how long I'm going to live? But I'm still dedicated to support this research institute because this is the future. This has been the reason we've had success and the future of this to keep this worldwide movement we've established right here in Dallas over the last 51 years. It won't continue unless we keep the research institute backing up everything we say. So I know I've run out of time, but I wanted to share that with you because this is something I have a tremendous interest in, as you can tell. And I just was, I had uh, Michael Burgess in just the other day, and he is a, uh, He's a, he's a U.S. representative here from Louisville, as you know. I gave him a presentation, basically what I just gave to you. I gave it to him when he came in. And he said, I want to present this in Washington. He's in charge, he's a physician, and he's in charge of the, of the physician caucus for both the House and the Senate. So we're still pending an invitation wants me to give an hour presentation to the caucus of the physicians, of the members of Congress in Washington. We hope to do that just in the next few weeks. So we do have a lot of interest in what we're doing on. I want to thank you for the opportunity to give this brief presentation to you that we're open for questions. So thank you, Dr. Cooper. That was a great and very interesting presentation. Thank you for all you do to help us improve the quality and quantity of our lives. We do actually have several questions from the audience that we would like to um, ask your opinion on. Um, the first question that I think you've addressed the issue of um, what made you successful? You address the issue of why you developed the Institute. Um, one of the questions I would ask is, what is the one thing you wish your patients would take your advice on? Because I know when I get near Dr. Cooper, I want to be active and fit. Without question, I would say exercise. I think we've proven that with the Medicare study. Just look at that one variable, how important that is. You can be fat and fit, you can be skinny and unfit, without question. I've also learned over the years that if you overwhelm your patient to come in, you're, you're smoking, you're drinking, you're overactive, and underactive, all these various things, on people to stop smoking, stop drinking, start exercising, I'll never see them again. You must take it a step at a time. So if you ask me, what's of all these things you're recommending as far as getting Cooper Ross, what's the one thing you concentrate on first? Avoid inactivity. And if I didn't say go out and run a marathon, I said avoid inactivity. How simple that is. 30 minutes collective or sustained most days per week can have tremendous minutes. It'll move you from at least a very poor, the poor category of fitness. We've proven this in our famous study published back in 19, 1983 in the Journal of American Medical Association. That's the all time most successful article we've ever published. That's November the 3rd, 1983. 1980, what was it, 83 or 89? I forgot, Laura. 1989. Yeah, okay. But that article, physical fitness, all cause mortality, showed if you move up one block on the fitness scale following 13,600 people for 8.6 years, they could decrease death from all causes by 58%, increase the life expectancy by six years. Remember that? But if they could go from the very poor to the top category of fitness, what much for the benefit? Increase life expectancy from six to nine years, decrease the death from all causes by 58 to 65%. It was not 1989, that was November the 4th, 1989, the article was published. I think without question, that's been the premier article we've had published, over 600 we've had published. To answer that question, I would say, yes, just to avoid inactivity. Let that be the first step. You might be surprised how soon you start feeling so much better. Over the years, I've asked people in exercising for year, what motivates you to continue exercising? And the majority say, because it makes me feel good. We have now proven that people who are physically fit are less depressed. They're less of a hypochondria, improved self-image, much more positive attitude towards life and fewer somatic things. You wanna have that enjoyment in life? I've had people tell me over the last 61, 55 years of practicing medicine, I wish I'd known 20 years ago how much better I could feel. I thought I felt good then. But once I embraced those concepts and got in shape, I didn't realize I could feel so good. I wish in retrospect, I started that 20 years ago. Don't waste that because it's never too late. We've had people 90 years of age starting into a program. 
played all right. He was genuinely started exercising and competing on the track until he was 90 years of age. Lived to 103, as you know. And by the time he passed away, he had 16 world records for mid over 90 running events from 60 meters to 3,000 meters. So again, it's never too late. That's the thing. As long as there's life, there's hope. Keep that in mind. But remember, if you ask me that question, I would say avoid inactivity. It's literally it's 30 minutes collective or sustained most days per week. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. I think that is such extraordinary wisdom is to avoid inactivity. Now, that raises the issue. So with COVID, we did become less active as a nation. And there's lots of studies out there that show people were less active. We certainly have made an effort to keep people more active. Um, and you talked about COVID and vitamin D. One of our um, listeners asked the question, what do you think about the COVID vaccine? I have no questions about that. We need it. The, the problems associated with the minimal, minimal problems that occur are minuscule compared to the benefits you can get from it. No, I've taken the vaccine. I'm happy to say, and Millie and I have both taken that. And we both have a very high uh, antibody level. Uh, Millie came in last week, she has a lot of level of, 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 of have an antibody level where with zero to 19 is normally it's 540. So we responded well to Moderna vaccine. I'm in the same situation. So we've got that. I'll have a person coming in, his son's going to college and he doesn't want to take the vaccine because he had some, he had some cardiac problems during his youth, but they're acquiring that they, or he goes to college. I will mention what college. So he's coming in, I'm getting two things. I'm getting his, his, getting his antibody level to see if he may have had a problem with COVID, then you know about it. And I'm getting his vitamin D level. If his vitamin D level is up in the 50s or 60s, I'm gonna write him a letter to the university and say, this man, according to our research, has a lot of protection against COVID-19 because he's been taking vitamin D and he has a level that's been shown to be protective to a great extent against COVID-19 and see if I can get him so he doesn't have to take the vaccine. But in general, I say take the vaccine. I've taken them, I encourage my patients to take it because don't, don't look death in the eye and say, I'm not gonna do that. Don't do it something stupid. One of the models around here is don't die of something stupid. Now preventive medicine, I hope with the documentary coming out this fall, it'll do two things. It'll make the physicians of the world more aware of the importance of the of the, of the importance of, of concentrating on chronic inflammation, but make the medical schools get more involved in modern preventive medicine because but preventive medicine, the medical schools is immunization. That's all. They're not talking about diet or exercise or things we're teaching and preaching here by King Cooper Eyes. I want to get that around the world in medical schools. Bring it back in. As I said, in the medical school, I was taught there was a center of the medical special because there's no profit in health, as I said earlier. We've got to change the attitude among physicians. He says, I can't make any money. I don't have the time. I'm not educated. As you and I both know, we didn't get our education on nutrition and exercise and all these things we're talking about in medical school. We got that at School of Public Health, as I did at Harvard. You did the same thing. So again, physicians got to bridge that gap. They get away from the concept of too much care too late. We spend twice as much money as anybody else in the world on healthcare. We rank 26 in longevity among the 35 major economic countries in the world right now. And our, our, our longevity is going, going down. It's dropped in the last two years. It's dropped, from, it's dropped from about one year in the last two years. So it's not going up, it's going down. Our longevity is. Face these things. We can do things about it, but we've got some answers and no one else is paying attention to it. We're getting more and more interest, I can guarantee you. And I hope with my presentations coming forthcoming in Washington, we'd be having more interest out of, of the capital and things that we're doing. So I think you're yeah, so I did, I did, people will be interested. I did get a, a response from, President Biden about my 90th birthday. And he congratulated me on making 90 years of age. I got the response. I got a second one. I got a third one, all saying the same thing. They're so confused up there. They don't even know what's going on. I keep getting the same thing. I've got three of them so far. <laughs> all the same thing from, from President Biden, making fun of that. But it's just, I appreciate it. But the fact is that I don't think there's that much knowledge about what we're doing. But I hope it gains a lot more in Washington if I have a chance to speak to those, those politicians. Well, I think, as I said at the beginning, one of the most important uh, messages you have gotten out over the years is that exercise is medicine. And it's generally safe medicine, and it's medicine everyone can do. And to your point right now, not being immobile is so critical. Um, OK, so let's talk about vitamin D. I know that's an area that you're extraordinarily interested in. And you um, already addressed some of the health benefits of vitamin D. But one thing people worry about is, um, can I get too much vitamin D? And when you talk about getting a level, can anybody's doctor get a vitamin D level for them or do you have to go somewhere special? 
They need to order, any physician can order a vitamin D, I'm sure. If they can't do it, they can send it out. And the toxic level is 150. We're a long ways from recommended by polycanist group from Boston University that 40 to 60 should be the goal for us. But I keep mine at that level. As I said, Millie was up to 80 the other day and I run about 64 myself. So again, that's the level that it's well within the tolerance level of 150 is the toxic level. So as far as getting too much, uh, there has been very little evidence of any toxicity of the curve for vitamin D, particularly keep the levels less than 150. Yeah, and don't they say that some of those California lifeguards have levels in the 125 range, so they get it more naturally because of their sun exposure and they don't have difficulties. Um, okay, so I want to uh, take a step back to the question about college students. Um, one of our listeners asked the question, what about healthy college students? You know, the issue with kids, certainly there's good literature that says that COVID in kids is less severe than in adults. Um, why would kids need a vaccine that might have bad side effects if they're otherwise healthy? Um, I question that really. And from these young kids, five and six, seven years of age, I can't really agree with that. I think because we know, as I said earlier, the studies from Great Bridges indicated that the instance of death from COVID is just almost non-existent. There's 99.9% .9 survival rate if a child comes down with a COVID infection. And to risk the problems, like this uh, patient I'm talking about that has a son that has a history of some cardiac problems during his youth. And we know that one thing is coming out and in men less than 20 years of age, it's myocarditis is something that we're seeing. You know, we're seeing other things that may come out, maybe Guillain-Barre or some things. A lot of people are seeing that now. So I think that you have to look at the odds. But the fact is we've seen a decline without question in the instance of COVID, particularly in the United States, because of the vaccination. If we don't pay attention to that, we're going to see those surges again, like we've had in the past. So I think we have to do two things. Most important, if I can tell this young man, he is his people that his colleagues is going to, this man has a vitamin D level of 60. And according to the literature, he has a lot of protection. And with a possible risk of having, having problems in the past, I would recommend he not take the vaccine. Now, this is a gentleman about 18, 19 years of age. Now, as far as young children, I can't buy that at all. I think children less than six years of age, putting and even wearing a mask and talking about the mask and the, giving the, carbon, the carbon dioxide problem with that and the disease curve with that. You have to consider all these things. These young kids, two and three and four years of age, wearing masks, they recommend. I can't, I can't recommend that at all. I cannot strongly recommend the vaccine in people less than, well, less than 10 years of age. Okay, so another COVID question. Um, what are your thoughts about masks and social distancing now that we are at a point where in North Texas, at least, we're nearing herd immunity? Um, and I've actually read one article that says we're there, but um, what do you think about masks? What do you think about social distancing at this point? Well, it depends. I still can't embrace a lot of close contact. Because the thing we have that have been immunized, the fact is we can still be harboring the virus in our mouth and give it to somebody else never come down with the problem. That's what they're saying is the problem here. So a close contact, I would tend to avoid that, particularly with older people. The major people that be concerned about people over 60 years of age, myself included. So that's one thing that I've kept in the back of my mind. If I can have the virus, but I've been immunized and never came out the problem, I can still give it to somebody else. That's what they're saying about young children too, though. They could say if they could have the virus don't come up a major problem, but they could transmit it to the teachers, for example. I think that's an overkill on that. I don't believe that that's a problem. And I think what we've done in, in cutting and closing down the schools and, and, and quarantining everybody has had such a devastating effect. I mean, as far as children are concerned with the opioid problems, with the addiction problems, with the, the suicides and all that, is we're having irreparable damage done to our children from the quarantine and from the mask. And this problem covering carbon dioxide and young, these young children and getting respiratory problems from that are just because of the, this inhaling things from you have a, a dirty mask on. I don't agree with that. And particularly outside. And they're even saying that these young kids should have the mask on outside. I don't agree with that at all. But I'm saying in general, particularly people of my age, people younger than my age, people past 60 years of age, without question, they're foolish that they don't, have a, don't take the vaccine. Very good. Thank you for your thoughts on that. Okay, so I'm gonna ask one last question. Um, so you alluded to divine intervention as a way that um, your um, both mission and vision was um, successful. You usually talk about three other things, and I think it's really important for 
um, our listeners to hear what you see as a comprehensive, um, uh, how you comprehensively succeeded. So it's a couple of things. Reasons for success as follows. Number one, divine intervention. Number two, a fantastic staff. Number three, we've proven it's cheap and more effective to maintain health and to prevent disease than to find the cure. And number four, if people realize they have a need, you provide a service, get the results they want, they will come back. And that's what's happened here. Why 74% of our patients return patients. Well, I tell the patients to keep this in mind. You really get success with our patients as follows. We make it an educational, motivational experience, number one. That's why our physicians see only two to three patients a day and spend about an hour and a half or at least. I, spend, I only see one patient a day. I spend hours with my patient. I love that doing that. They become my friends and my patients. They come back overwhelming. So, but we, but make it educational, motivational experience, number one. And number two, we give them recommendations how to change their lifestyle with safe, effective, and realistic. And number four, number three is we give them back. So educate, we have, first of all, the very most comprehensive examination in America. And I still think we're better even ahead of Cleveland Clinic. Number two, educational, motivational experience. Make it and make recommendations and safe and safe and realistic and get it back. That's the four step approach that we use in getting successful with our patients. Two things. Why well, I've been successful, I told you, and we recommend to our patients while they're living longer. Superb. So thank you so much, Dr. Cooper, for your um, presentation today and for answering the questions. I think certainly the COVID questions are on everybody's mind. Um, I would like to close today with first thanking our listeners for joining us. I also want to inter invite you to our next Coffee with Cooper, which is scheduled for Wednesday, August 25th, with Dr. Nina Radford, who is the Director of Clinical Research at the Cooper Clinic. She will focus on understanding coronary artery disease risk and discuss how to predict your risk of developing coronary artery disease and how the coronary artery calcium score, or CAC, helps define that risk. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for being Cooperized. And I hope that everybody has a great day. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. Thank you.